uh, I guess uh, <laughs> this time we're going to sort of move to sort of thinking about uh, science and genomics uh, for uh, um, guiding therapy and also get a little bit into some of the detailed questions about the use of molecular testing uh, to help with uh, clinical care. And this talk is going to build on a lot of things that we've heard earlier. Um, you know, very importantly is that it really builds upon our uh, switch in our broadest way we think about developing cancer therapies from, you know, an older approach where we really were just mixing and matching different uh, poisonous compounds empirically uh, to now uh, approaches where we're really trying to understand what makes each cancer uh, tick and go after uh, the key things that are either making the cancer grow or what are sort of other vulnerabilities in the cancer that are informed by um, our uh, uh, understanding of the basic biology. And a key way that we think about understanding the biology of any cancer is by looking at the genome. And again, we've heard a lot about uh, DNA through this um, uh, uh, series of talks, especially from Matt Yergelin. But basically, every cell in our body, all the you know, trillions of cells, have uh, the DNA that we inherited from our parents, basically split into 23 pairs of chromosomes, uh, so strings of, you know, billions of letters, A, C, Gs, and Ts. And these are basically the cookbook the, for, for building all of the proteins in the cell that do the work of the cell. And a simple way to think about cancer is that um, just like um, a car, um, a, every cell in our body has sort of gas pedals and it has brakes. It has parts of the cell whose job is to make that cell <laughs> grow, and it has parts of the cell whose job it is to slow things down. And what we have in cancer is their activation of genes or turning on genes aberrantly, which are the gas pedals, and uh, inactivating the genes, which are the genes which are the brakes. Um, so basically, you're uh, cutting the port, the, the parts of this uh, of, of the cancer that slow growth, and activating the parts that promote growth. And that you know the combination can obviously be catastrophic. Now I'm going to sort of highlight a couple points that came up earlier, especially from Matt Yergelin, that when we're thinking about uh, cancer genomes, we're thinking in two big categories: the somatic and the germline. Um, so the somatic is the main point of this talk and the main work of the work, um, the, the, the main aspect of the work that I largely do and is the most uh, critical part of guiding cancer therapy. And these are the way that the cancer cells are different than the cells of the rest of the body. So these are uh, changes or mutations that were not inherited. Um, and most cancer genes fall into this category, and most targeted therapies really uh, re relate to these classes of alterations. And importantly, these are the changes that are not uh, passed on uh, to children. Now, the, the contrast are uh, the kind of alterations that Matt talked about earlier, which are in what's called the germline. These are largely what you inherit from your parents. These are in all cells of the body. And many of these, such as BRCA1, which is a famous gene, or CDH1, which we learned about earlier, are uh, involved in cancer risk. Now, most patients' cancers are not caused by these. Um, for this talk, we're really going to talk about the, uh, the somatic aspect, again, how the cancer cells are different than the cells of the rest of your body. And there's different ways that cancer genes uh, can get uh, mutated or, um, you know, aberrantly turned on and turned off. Um, there are what we call mutations where basically the letters that spell the individual gene get an individual typographical error, like an A gets turned to a T or vice versa, and there are several famous cancer genes that commonly get activated this way. Um, there are also what are called amplifications and deletions, where you lose a part of a gene or part of a chromosome, or amplifications where you can gain extra copies. Normally, for every gene in your body, you have one copy from your mom, one copy from, um, from your dad in each, um, each cell. But you could have situations where that gene gets amplified, such as the HER2 gene in many gastric and esophageal or breast cancers. Instead of having two copies of the gene, you might have 40, 50, you know, 200 copies of that gene. And those are the patients when that you have many extra copies, that those are the tumors that are highly sensitive to the drugs like trastuzumab that we heard about in the TOGA trial that block that pro-growth um, protein. <clears throat> 
Uh, and lastly, you could have the, the, the examples such as the one that Dr. Cleary mentioned earlier, where you have two genes that are brought together to make something that doesn't exist in nature, such as e EML4 ALK. But the idea is there's different ways that uh, cancer genes can be broken, there are different ways, um, and that also the kind of test you do to look for these gene changes also depends on what you're looking for. And an important um, point to all this is that, you know, the reason we are doing this so much and trying to test the genome of individual patients is we have an increasing idea that uh, there's be a, a key ways that genome new profiling can help us not just understand how cancer works, but how we could use that to guide cancer therapy. You know, the, uh, the simple analogy is that the things that are making cancer uh, grow, the things that made a normal cell turn to cancer, um, you know, still be, are still important for that cancer once it's become cancer. So if you could take it away, that could be very valuable. So if your car is, you know, um, you know, if your car is, grow, is going too fast because the gas pedal is stuck into the floor, if you could unstick the gas pedal, you know, that will slow the, the, um, slow the car down. And we know that generally the drugs that are able to block these genes that are turned on aberrantly and are making the cancer grow, um, those, if they're given the right, the right target, the right drug to block the right you know, gene, the right protein, the right patient, um, that can be very effective. You know, the, the key uh, point, though, behind a lot of this is that even though two patients might have tumors that look essentially the same under the microscope, the different genes that are active can be quite different in Mr. Jones versus uh, Mr. Smith, and that's why we don't just say we give, you know, trastuzumab to everyone with esophageal and gastric cancer, but we give it to people who have that particular um, feature. And so the, the key idea is that increasingly if we could profile each patient's tumor is that would give us new ideas of what's making each tumor tick and help us pick what might be some of the, the best therapies, either for therapies that exist already or increasingly that's incre incredibly important as we think about clinical trials and what trial might be appropriate for, for which patient. Now, um, <clears throat> now, there's also other ways that increasingly understanding the molecular features of cancer um, can help us think about guiding therapy. Um, you know, um, you know, in the simple way in the past was, you know, gene X is turned on, so you want to give a drug that, you know, hits X. That was the um, simple approach. But now we're also finding other ways that uh, profiling of tumor can uh, inform um, what to think about um, in terms of therapies. So, for example, there's more evidence now that not just individual genes being altered, but the pattern of changes can be a marker of the kind of um, messed up processes in the cell for, for dealing with damage to the genome. And that can often inform us about the kind of uh, therapies that patients might benefit from. You know, for example, there are uh, patients commonly with ovarian cancer and now some with pancreatic cancer who have defects in how their uh, cells fix kind of errors to d DNA, and you could see marks of the, that error-prone activity in the cancer genome, and that can help you pick certain therapies. Also another clear example that's emerged uh, recently is that you could see a mark in the cancer genome of something called microsatellite instability. That's not any one gene that's turned on, but that's a marker of a type of, you know, a messed up repair process in the cell, and that tells you about uh, the, um, the potential for, um, um, uh, for, for using immune therapy in those patients. You know, one other way that um, also genome uh, testing is helping us now is also, and I'll, I'll mention later, there's new evidence about new tools called circulating DNA, not just to tell us what's going on in the individual patient, but to find presence of um, uh, cancer in the blood, and that has uh, implications for several areas, including uh, there's exciting ideas that people after surgery, that these uh, tests can help us understand who's at highest risk of recurrence. Um, now, um, and so, now, I want to also say that we talk a lot about we're trying to study the genes, 
in guide therapy. But it's also important to note that targeted therapy is not gene therapy. We're not trying to do therapies to change genes. We think of genes are, are the cookbook, so the, the recipe to make proteins in the cell. So you know your KRAS gene makes the KRAS protein, and proteins do the work. And so if you have an abnormal gene, then you make an abnormal protein. And drugs almost universally attack um, proteins, so targeted therapies attack um, <laughs> proteins. So we're not treating the genes, but the genes tell us which proteins to use. So the HER2 test is telling us something about you know, a gene change of HER2 and then use that as a reason to attack the HER2 protein. And so now our goal is that we could put these patients into more uh, meaningful groups and seeing that there are or this possibility that one group of patients that seem the same actually are different. Um, and, and a lot of our ability to do this really stems from technology. And you know, in many ways, we think about how fast technology has moved, and you know, we each you know, carry around you know, you know, uh, computers. And I probably, if I were to calculate this, probably the, I think the hard drive in my phone probably has about, um, the size of this is probably about 4,000 times the hard drive of my computer when I started college, which seems like an, an incredible you know, advance, but actually that, um, that actually, that improvement pales in, in comparison to what we've been able to do with studying D DNA. And I'll say, you know, for example, you know, when people have heard of the Human Genome Project, and when that happened, you know, not that many years ago, you know, to take a single patient and sequence their genome, you know, was really hundreds of millions of dollars in years of work. Um, and now that's less than $1,000 in days of work. So, you know, a, you know, a couple decades ago to say we were going to take, you know, 500 people with gastric cancer and sequence their normal genome, sequence their cancer genome and see what's different, you know, even if you were, um, you know, Bill Gates, you couldn't do that. Um, now, you know, that's something that's increasingly feasible, so now we have this new understanding of what's happening in the genome, and also these things have gotten inexpensive enough that they become assays we could use in the, um, in the clinic as well. And so basically the summary of the background is that, you know, there's broken genes in cancer. You know, now we have a lot of exciting therapies that could attack some of these drivers, and we have this new map of what's um, going on. Um, so um, now we've been, done a lot now to understand this in the, in the realm of gastric and esophageal cancer. I don't want to get into the weeds of this, but we've led some big uh, project that's really sort of mapped out what is wrong in the DNA of these cancers, both what are the, um, the, the, the genes that are turned on, the genes that are turned off, what are the different kinds of groups, and what are the different kind of categories um, of cancers. And just a few kind of highlights of this. I guess you can't, still can't see the cursor, but highlights are that one is that you know, from a molecular standpoint, esophageal squamous cancer and esophageal adenocarcinoma are totally different. And I know that there's a lot of confusion about esophageal adeno, GE junction, gastric. You know, I think increasingly, you know, the, the, the adenocarcinomas are really very cohesive. And really, I think of increasingly that um, um, esophageal adenocarcinoma is more of an extension of the most common form of gastric cancer. And these, you no, know, since most patients here are the adenocarcinomas, really have four main flavors. These are what are called chromosomally unstable. That's most of what we see, most of what's at the G junction. The microcellular unstable, again, responsive to the immunotherapy. There's a group that have what's called the Epstein Barr virus, the same thing that causes mono, and also a group that's overwhelmingly the um, diffuse gastric cancer patients. And just one quick data slide, but the important thing is that the patients in, uh, who are responding very well to immunotherapy, the ones in red and blue overwhelmingly are the ones with MSI and EBV. So I think that's increasingly the idea that there's two groups of tumors which are the most responsive to immunotherapy. Um, so we have a lot of work to do on the others in terms of making therapy better. So now, in terms of real life, um, you know, people often are thinking, how do I use this? How do we use these tests to, to guide therapy? And so some of the questions are, you know, what do you test? You, you know, primary tumor, metastatic tumor, blood. When do you test? Do you test it when you're first diagnosed, when you get, you know, progression on therapy? And also how to test, you know, they're doing test for one gene or for, you know, a, a panel or for whole genome sequencing. There's, you know, uh, so a lot of this is a, a 
moving area, but here's a couple of thoughts. Um, so the vast majority now in terms of what to test is done on primary to or on, on tumor tissue, actual, you know, pieces of tissue that came out of the body, which can be from surgery, which is generally the primary tumor, or biopsies that can be endoscopic biopsies from the time of initial diagnosis from the primary, or even metastatic biopsies of, say, a liver metastasis or um, so forth. <clears throat> so one, um, you know, studying tumor tissue is a very effective way to study the cancer DNA. An inherent limitation is that when you're, when you, if you have a piece of tumor from the esophagus and you're studying the DNA, inherently you are looking at the DNA of what's there. So, you know, you're not looking, if there's a, you know, metastasis in the liver and there's a tumor in the, um, in the, um, uh, um, in, in the esophagus, you biopsy esophagus, you are studying the d DNA of the es esophagus. You're not looking at the uh, DNA necessarily of the, the metastatic lesion. Of course, the, you know, the, you know, the metastasis came from the primary, but doesn't mean that there aren't uh, important changes. You know, and because we realize now increasingly how, as has come up earlier, the tumor genome can be dynamic in multiple ways. It can be dynamic spatially because from that cell that was in the esophagus to the cell that got to the liver, there are many times those cells divided and grew, and every time that happens, you know, more changes can happen. Um, and we realize that these things aren't all the same. Uh, so there's a lot of excitement now about new ways to ask these questions. And there's limitations to how many places we could put <laughs> needles in to ask these questions. And so now what's emerging is very exciting is the possibility of using what are called liquid biopsies to take advantage of the fact that, nor that cancer cells often, not always, will sh as they, some cells die, will shed DNA into the blood. And so by getting blood samples, you can find something about the tumor. That's why it's in the Cal -Mean project, we're actually getting blood to, to do this. And here's just an example of just not to go into the weeds here, but, um, but essentially, you know, example of looking at the profile of a tumor DNA from an actual tumor and the plasma, seeing how you're seeing the same changes in, in both. So there are various um, advantages and disadvantages now to these uh, different approaches. So, you know, cell-free DNA obviously has advantages. You know, it's relatively easier um, to get blood. And results from blood testing can help you m find what may have been missed from a single biopsy. You know, because it's easier to get multiple blood samples than multiple tumor biopsies, it could be better for understanding how tumors change over time and what might happen as tumors become resistant to therapy. Um, and as I mentioned, in addition to the setting of people with established advanced cancer, there is new exciting data that blood biopsies might help us understand uh, who has the highest risk of the cancer coming back after surgery. So those are some of the good things with um, uh, using cell-free DNA. Now there are some uh, disadvantages as well. So not all tumors do what we call shedding. Not all tumors have a, a lot of visible DNA in the blood. For example, there are certain gastric cancers that spread a lot into the peritoneal cavity. Um, now those could have a lot of cancer, but because they're in the peritoneum, those are poorly seen in the blood. And also, you know, um, you know, the blood test can be useful when things are positive, but we don't know how useful they are when they're negative. You know, because of the variation in the amount of uh, tumor DNA in the blood patient to patient, you know, if you wanted to say, oh, am I a candidate for Herceptin, am I HER2 amplified, you know, if you, if you see HER2, that's great, but if it's negative, it's hard to, underst uh, to understand a negative data in the blood. Whereas in a tumor cell, you see the cell, you've done the HER2 testing, you can see that cancer cell is negative. So, you know, that's an important caveat. You know, when to test is also an important question. You know, as a general rule of thumb that you learn in clinical training is that you do a test because you're going to do something with the answer. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not going to change what you do based on the result of the test, you shouldn't, you know, do the test. Um, and so, um, and so it's important to, um, to think about, you know, doing the test in, in times when you have to act on the information.
And so when people are first diagnosed with metastatic cancer, now we're doing the test because there are features like HER2 and MSI, at that point will help us understand, you know, what to do. And there'll be other situations when a test might be informative, such as when your people are considering clinical trials and which one of the phase one trials from Dr. Cleary might be the best one to um, uh, be um, to go on. So in that situation, doing a test at that time can be helpful to guide where to go. And, um, and one thing that I think is increasingly important is because cancers evolve over time, especially when in response to therapy, you know, you have to be careful about using old samples to understand what you're dealing with now. You know, you've had situations where someone had a tumor diagnosed, they got their, you know, a, uh, you know, um, a biopsy of their esophageal cancer, then they got chemotherapy, then they got radiation, then they got surgery, and then the tumor came back <clears throat> a year later, then they got full fox, and then a year later they need to go on a clinical trial, and they say, oh, let's go back to that tumor sample from two and a half years ago to see, well, what's, what's going on in the DNA of that cancer? And I would say that makes me a little bit nervous because a lot of happened in that interim. And what was, you know, taken out from that biopsy two and a half years ago compared to after chemotherapy, after radiation, after this, and what's now spread to the liver or lung could be quite different. And so it's very reasonable now to think about, let's understand what we're dealing with today, is that might help us be best pick the right therapy. And I think there's a lot of clinical trials in the past that were negative because they didn't do that, and they used the old sample, and because of that, they gave patients the wrong drugs. So I think now in a lot of these clinical trials, and James will comment on this, because they know this and they want to find the right drug for the right patients, they're increasingly saying, let's get a sample right before people go on trials and test it, because we want to make sure we're actually treating what we know we're <laughs> treating. Um, and so, you know, so and we're also using this to guide our research, you know, because we know that um, these tumors can be heterogeneous and can vary over space and over time, um, is that we're trying to understand how to do this better, not just to guide therapy now, but to guide therapy in the future. So we have some very active research projects, you know, what we're doing that both research and clinical. So we have projects here in all of our patients with metastatic gastroesophageal cancer. When people progress on therapy, uh, we are trying to uh, um, encourage our patients to get repeat metastatic biopsies, and then we are sending those for repeat genome testing, not research testing, clinical testing, so we could return the data to the uh, patients, but we're also uh, getting uh, plasma so that for research, we could be answering the question for the future, you know, if we had rebiopsied a patient and we had that data and the plasma, you know, does that, is that good enough? Because maybe two years from now, we'll have the answer that, well, we don't have to rebiopsy. Maybe doing plasma will be enough. But we don't know that now until we've done both, looked at them side by side to, 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 to figure this out. And the other benefit of this program is when we're getting biopsies of metastatic cancer, we're also making extra cancer cells that we could grow in the laboratory for, for doing more research and generate the next um, uh, uh, therapies of the future. And so in terms of how to test, you know, there's a range. There's single gene tests, just looking at one gene like HER2. There are what are called panel tests, such as what we do here called uh, the Onco panel, or what's offered by companies like Foundation Medicine, where you look at three or 400 sort of well-known cancer genes and look for mutations and it, amplifications in some <laughs> translocations. Um, there even there's some small panel tests now for plasma. There's also comprehensive things like whole genome or <laughs> sequencing, which are usually done as part of research. And here's just an example of a HER2 test where you do what's called FISH, where you have a little probe that glows red that binds to the HER2 gene. And on the, on the right, you see a normal cell where there's generally two you know, pink dots per cell, two copies of HER2, one from mom, one from dad, and a cancer cell where that gene has been amplified. Now you have many, many extra copies of HER2. And so that's an example of how you could clearly see that cell. That's a HER2 positive cell. And so now we have, again, we have this effort, as others have um, uh, uh, mentioned, we're trying to do this in our patients here. Uh, you know, we're getting consent for patients for genome testing. Uh, you know, we're getting this, you know, right now from tumor tissue, not from plasma, and we're trying to use this to guide therapy. Um, but it's also important to think about, you know, how this is great, but how we have to kind of build and make this better.
Um, you know, because, you know, you could imagine that, you know, this could be easy. You'd have, you know, people with mutations of X, Y, or Z, and that means you just need, you know, anti-X, Y, or Z, and treating cancer would be very easy. But we unfortunately know that cancers are uh, a hard problem, and we might think we have the right drug for the right patient, and we're trying to do, to, to do this to the patient. But unfortunately, the, 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 uh, the tumor sees that and decides to take a way around it. So we, we uh, you know, recognize that, you know, cancers are, are smart. Um, and even good targeted therapies when they work, you know, generally will work uh, temporarily, but tumors learn to develop resistance. They could be faster, you know, sometimes it could, you know, take, you know, uh, some years to happen. And, you know, we also have to think about how we're always making our therapies <laughs> better. And this really involves work in the laboratory uh, so we could bring these uh, best ideas forward. And just as James, you know, mentioned that all of the new <laughs> drugs that we're using now from immunotherapy to targeted drugs all start out with work in the laboratory for years before we, um, you know, get them into patients. Um, You know, so um, so you no, know, we have that's you know, a lot of work going on now in our group. You know, working um, in our laboratory from uh, different samples from our patients and from using um, um, you know tumor cells we grow in the laboratory, using blood samples and tumor uh, uh, genomes in terms of seeing how tumors become resistant to therapy. Is we're basically you know figuring out how cancers try to work around our therapy and what we can do uh, you know next and essentially it's sort of like playing a game of chess against cancer. Is you when you, you when you make a move in chess you say I'm going to make this move and you're thinking what's the opponent going to do next and how do you kind of get ready you know to to meet them at the next phase. In reality, this is very similar. We're trying to develop therapies, understanding what are the vulnerabilities how we make that attack, and then which way cancer is going to go next. So we could sort of, you know, try to, you know, you know, kind of build that one-two punch that will uh, actually have much more long-term and meaningful benefits. Uh, so uh, in terms of um, some uh, overall um, summaries here, so overall, um, mutant genes uh, largely cause cancer and can increasingly tell us what are the best candidate targets for different tumors, but we also realize that the cancer genome can evolve and be heterogeneous. So just because, um, you know, a tumor had one profile, you know, when patient was diagnosed in a primary tumor biopsy, that doesn't mean that things are necessarily the same in, say, a metastatic biopsy f from a year later. Um, you know, we, um, you know, we and uh, many others are, um, are trying to think about how to best use these data to, to guide both new, new um, clinical trials, new therapy today, as well as inform the science we're doing to help bring the better therapies for um, the, the future. And, um, and so it's very exciting, but there's clearly uh, much that we have to do, and so um, we're still hard at work. So uh, thank you very much for your time, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Adam. That was great. Um, questions for Adam Bess? Okay. Okay. Yes. I have a question. First of all, um, I guess you, I had asked a question earlier about um, sort of the process of mutation, and maybe we'll cover that. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, we have that. Yes. But yeah. the other, the other part, sort of the first part of that was is I was diagnosed in um, June, so not that long ago, and a lot of what I read suggested. Esophageal cancer was highly correlated in treatment and metastasization to breast cancer, and that they were testing a lot of drugs back and forth. You seem to suggest, or I think you clearly suggested, in fact, that it's more linked to stomach cancer. Can you talk a little bit about how how is this a genetic distinction, or is this a disease progression? Like, I'm not sure how to frame the question, but. You know, sort sort of is part of the question. You could say about why are different cancers different? Yeah, is you it know, and I think that's that's a great question because clearly, you know, there are tumors, say prostate cancer, which grow and metastasize over a slower time frame, and then there's things like maybe, you know, that on one side and then pancreas is on the other. So you know, there are which are very rapid, very aggressive. So you know, the the kind of cell that you start in, you know, impacts what happens when that cell gets some of those 
um, mutations. That's clearly part of it. Um, I mean, your question also is why is it that esophageal and gastric cancer are so similar? You know, is it just happens to be that because they're neighbors that they're so similar? I think, you know, um, part of this gets into where Barrett's esophagus comes from. I mean, in general, Barrett's esophagus really, where the, the origin of esophageal adenocarcinoma really always starts at exactly where the stomach hits the esophagus. And there's actually increasing ideas that what happens is that basically when your lower esophagus gets injured, that basically stomach cells sort of move in and do the repair and are the source of Barrett's esophagus. You know, and it sort of it makes sense because the tumors are just so remarkably similar that, you know, it, it you know, I think, and there's, it's controversial, but I think there's more data that basically, I think that really, you know, Barrett's esophagus is an extension of sort of gastric cells moving north to help repair the damage in the setting of acid reflux. And so I think it's part of why that these are so overwhelmingly similar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, other questions for Adam? We, of course, please write down your questions on the cards. Uh, we'll be uh, having another panel discussion uh, at the end. Now, I just saw that there's very healthy snacks at the back of the room, and I'm sure that our next speaker wouldn't mind if people got up briefly and uh, got a, a few bites to eat, but uh, I see uh, veggies and uh, hummus and, and all sorts of healthy stuff back here. Um, you certainly can have it on your way home, but if you wanted a, a brief snack, that would be fine. Otherwise, we're going to move on to our last speaker, who's going to take us home.